Good evening, everyone. It's great to be back with you on the Facebook Live. My name is Lloyd Douglas, and I'm the public health physician for the Sulu Cult First Nations Health Authority. And it's great to have a colleague of mine, um, Dr. James Brooks. And uh, tonight, I'm not in the hot seat. He's in the hot seat. So he'll be answering all the questions tonight. Uh, it's going to be fun. I'm going to be Nick tonight, actually. And I'm uh, looking forward to that. Uh, so we're happy to have Dr. Uh, Brooks. And uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Lloyd. So uh, I'm Dr. James Brooks. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I've done a lot of different things, but uh, now I'm uh, uh, proud to be uh, serving First Nations communities in, uh, from ISC Ontario region. So I, I run the health protection unit here, and Dr. Douglas has invited me for the National Immunization Awareness Week so that we can talk about uh, vaccination. And I think anything else that Lloyd thinks uh, he'd like to put me on the hot seat about probably related to COVID. So, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna ask for forgiveness here for a second. I'm, I'm in the office here in Ottawa and I'm a rare public servant because it's six o'clock and I'm still at my desk. So I'm going, I just have to go turn on the lights. I'll be right back. Uh, that's okay, Dr. Brooks. We're, we're happy to have you. Uh, as you're turning the lights on, um, yes, it's National Immunization Awareness Week. And uh, now, then, kind of like never before, immunizations, vaccinations, um, you know, getting the shot is so important. And um, I just want to encourage each and everyone, especially with regards to COVID-19, you know exactly what to do. And uh, Dr. Brooks is back um, in the hot seat and I'm gonna turn the fire on with my first question for Dr. Brooks. So um, Dr. Brooks, tell me, and I'm gonna try to do it like Nick because Nick has a way of asking these questions. Um, so uh, Dr. Brooks, uh, tell me, do I still need a COVID booster if I had two shots and then I got COVID? Do I still need a booster? So that's, uh, that's an excellent, uh, excellent question. Thank you for that, Nick, Lloyd. The, uh, the short answer to that question is yes, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. So you get some protection with, with two doses. And I'm gonna have a, um, a kind of a recurrent theme that I think, and as many people agree with me, that to be up to date with vaccination in the Omicron era, is to have three doses. So that is what you're describing as the two doses plus a booster. So if you've had the two doses, what we know is that over time, your protection against getting infected with Omicron decreases. So, uh, and so you have an infection with Omicron after receiving two doses and your level of immunity will increase. But just like if you've, uh, um, with the vaccine itself, over time, that immunity will decrease. And so you'll again become susceptible to infection. And, and the susceptibility to infection is important for not only you, but it's also for your community. So if you become infected, then you come back to community and then you can transmit the virus to somebody else. So you protect not only yourself, but um, other people and you get vaccinated. So, even though you've had two doses and then you've become infected, your immunity will decrease over time. And the only way to get it boosted again is to take that next shot. And when you take that next shot, you get, uh, after a couple of weeks, you have very, very high levels of protection against Omicron. And hopefully if there's a new variant coming along, but the best way that you can protect yourself against any new variants is ensuring that you are up to date with your vaccinations. And it doesn't matter whether you've had COVID before, but that means at least three doses in, in adults. So that's the long answer to, to the uh, question. And the short answer is yes, you still need your vaccines. Yeah, I like both answers. Uh, um, so yes, you need a <laughs> booster shot. All right, so um, you know we, we, we've heard this, uh, Dr. Brooks and, um, you know, probably in the past, I may have spoken to this, but uh, have you heard that the booster side effects are worse? Is, is that true? So, Dr. Douglas, 
I've been thinking about some questions and this is, there's actually three, three answers to the, to the question that you've asked. And, and I went, I spent some time looking this up, looking at what the CDC had to say about this, what the Public Health Agency of Canada had to say about this, and, and also what they, they said out, out of the UK. Okay, so an important thing is that the frequency, like how likely is it that you're going to have side effects in your second or third dose compared to the first dose? And I was surprised to find out that in fact, it's less likely to happen when you get the, your side effects when you get the second dose or the third dose. So that's the first. The second thing is you're asking about whether the side effects are worse when you get uh, the second dose. And, and the, the, the answer to that question is they may be, but we're talking about in terms of the type of side effects that people experience very mild. So these are things like a sore arm and you might have a fever, those sorts of side effects. And they might be a bit more intense with uh, this, the second dose or the third dose, but again, you're not as likely to get them. And the way that you can uh, address that or the way that you can um, uh, lessen the discomfort with that is to take as directed by the person who's uh, providing the immunization, something like Tylenol, or Advil, those sorts of medicine, and they can help alleviate a lot of the symptoms. And um, uh, what was the other thing here? Yeah, that's, I covered it. The, the type of um, side effects that you get are typically the, the same. And that's the, as I described, sore arm, fever, you might have a headache. And so there's nothing there's nothing more alarming when you get uh, subsequent doses. And the other thing about it is to, to re-emphasize, you're less likely to get them. So it's certainly not any reason not to get the second or the third dose. I think that's probably the most important message that I can convey is that uh, um, these are not things that you should worry about and there are not things that you should, uh, should stop you from having your second and third dose. Okay, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I remember my own experience and it's been it's been good thus far, all three doses and just very mild side effects and also members of my household, just very, very mild side effects. I think my daughter, she didn't even, she didn't have any side effects at all. So that's awesome. All right. Uh, next question. How many COVID boosters will we need to get? You now we talk about the fourth dose. It's now available for First Nations 18 and older who are eligible. Um, how many COVID boosters will we need to get? And that's probably a, a tough question because I know you don't have a crystal ball <laughs> looking into the future, but take a shot at it. Sure, so thanks for that question, Lloyd. So um, I'm going to um, uh, make a pitch for a podcast that I've, I've started listening to. So it's available wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, it's put out by SIDRAP, so C-I-D-R-A-P, and it's the Center for Infectious Diseases Research and Policy. And there's a gentleman that does this podcast, I think he's done more than 100 podcasts now about COVID-19. His name is Dr. Os Osterholm. And he talks about his crystal ball and he says his crystal ball is covered in six inches of mud. And I think he is exactly right because you're asking me to peer into my crystal ball and I can't even see the crystal. But I, 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 won't, I won't dodge your question, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on. But Dr. Osterholm also says that uh, if you believe the things that I'm going to predict will happen, then I have a bridge to sell you, meaning that you know, it, you have to sort of take this with um, um, just that it's like it's like picking the winner of the Super Bowl. We're talking about the NFL draft today and uh, it's happening Monday and already people are putting odds on who will be the Super Bowl winner. So I think it's it's in that category. How many boosters are we going to need? Well, I think that uh, what we can learn from is history and, and the history has taught us a couple of things is that uh, I think most people would have anticipated that uh, 
the pro what used to be called the primary series, that is two doses, was going to be sufficient to keep people safe until the fall when the predictions were that there may be a new wave of COVID coming through. So the first lesson that we've learned there is that best guesses by public health officials may not always be right when we're dealing with COVID-19. It's a very, very tricky virus and, and the, the virus in its current form is new within humans. So it's taking every opportunity it can to find uh, it's, uh, it's adapting to infect as many people as possible. So the first lesson is that it changed and Omicron came along. And Omicron, like each previous version of the virus is more infectious. And there are new variants that are even more infectious than um, Omicron, the original B1 and B2 variants, which are now circulating. And so as a result of that, the perspective on when we needed to have the booster changed and it became, and we had to get it much earlier. So now, uh, Lloyd, you're asking me to predict whether or not there's going to be a new variant coming out that we're going to have to get a booster for again. And that is how long do I think that the three or four doses will keep immunity strong? And <clears throat> because I don't know the answer to that question, I can't say how many boosters that will get. My best guess would be that influenza is an old friend that public health officials have been dealing with for a century. And as it's found its steady state infecting humans, it has waves that come through every year. And every year, you should still get your influenza vaccine. So I would say that if uh, the word booster, I think, will disappear from our language. And instead, what we will probably be looking at in the future is an annual vaccination with COVID-19. That's my best guess, Lloyd, but I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on it as uh, um, it's, uh, it's been a real challenge. One of the things that COVID-19 has taught everybody in the world, but especially public health people, is humility because we've always been tripped up when we thought that we had certainty um, so that uh, um, we've always tried to keep people safe to the best of our ability, but predicting too far into the future is a challenge. So Dr. Douglas, how do you, what do you think about a, a booster and how many will we need? Oh, James is tricky. James is tricky, Nick. <laughs> so I, I'll say it like this. I am expecting the unexpected when it comes on to COVID-19. And I am certain of the uncertainties of COVID-19. And you are right. I will remain humble. And I will just kind of ride these waves. Um, when we see things changing, we just kind of implement whatever measures it will take, including additional doses, probably into the sunset. I don't know how long. But that's what we'll do. No one knows. And I agree with you that I believe that we'll probably get to a point where we'll have annual COVID-19 vaccines, just like the annual flu shot. I see that Nick is um, on and probably there's a question online for us. Um, do you have a question for us, Nick? Uh, yeah, we do have uh, a couple of people uh, in queue here. Um, <clears throat> we'll get started with uh, the first question. And um, th this one might be more directed uh, to Dr. Douglas, but maybe you can discuss the availability. Um, but the question is coming from Christine, and uh, they're asking, uh, where do you get the fourth dose uh, in Sulaco? Okay, all right, awesome. That's a great question. So, uh, hi, Christine. Um, great question. Uh, this morning, I heard from Dr. Kit Young-Hoon, the Medical Officer of Health for the Northwestern Health Unit, and she states that the clinics and getting the vaccines are now at the local office. So I guess it would be um, the office on Front Street. But what I would ask you to do kindly is to probably give the health unit a call and probably book an appointment. I think that's how they're doing it. I'm not sure as to when they'll have you know the next clinic or anything like that. So 
Um, thank you for your question and just kind of re please reach out to the health unit directly and uh, hopefully someone there will tell you exactly when and where you can get the fourth dose. Great, thank you, Dr. Good Douglas. answer, Dr. Douglas. Um, we'll go ahead and move into our next question uh, on our Facebook feed. Uh, and this one is coming uh, from Mike and, um, and Dr. Brooks, uh, of course, you know, um, you can, yeah, this one's to you. Uh, this one is, you have a community with 1000 people in the five and up age group. Your vaccination rate is 40%. The recent study says that the unvaccinated will infect the vaccinated. Is that what we look forward to, to keep being infected over and over and over again? With the BA2 and XE on the horizon, how will the reinfection look, look like? What can you suggest to move the unvaccinated to take the, vac the vaccine? If you need me to repeat any I of it, no problem. I think we got it. I, and, and I'll take a stab at it first, James, because I want you to really think about your answer. So I'll give you a little <laughs> bit of time. I'll buy some time for you, James. Um, so Mike, thank you for the question. And um, that's a very good question. I think the article you're talking about came out in the Canadian Medical Association Journal um, uh, this week. It talks about kind of, you know, mixing unvaccinated group of people with the vaccinated. And what they find is that among the vaccinated, we see, you know, an increased rate of even reinfections there, you know, rather than if everyone was vaccinated. And that's a reality. And um, what you may see happening um, in a community, 1,000 people, 5 plus, 40% vaccinated, um, not sure if everyone in even that um you know, category is up to date with their vaccination. That's another term you'll hear about fully vaccinated. That's technically just two doses. But being up to date is, you know, the latest booster that you're eligible for, whether it's the third or the third or the fourth. And that's that's a that's a real, real problem that we have to tackle in our communities. Here what Mike, here's what I have learned. Um, and I know that Mike, you know this as well. I have learned that when the community uh, you know, the leadership is on board and the community uh, elders are on board and we have that transparent conversation. They're able to ask us all the questions. We provide them clear answers, like sometimes like what we just did, we do not know what will happen in the future. And once that trust is there, we find that that mic translates to the community membership. And um, so we have to continue having the conversation with leadership in our communities and, and the elders in our communities. And we also are very mindful of, uh, you know, the history um, within, uh, you know, our First Nations communities, some of our First Nations communities. Some communities, their leadership are, you know, on the ball. There is one small community um, wherein, you know, uh, they have already administered quite a bit of fourth doses, very high uh, third dose rate. Um, you know, things are going very well and they, they, they have kind of lower infection rates throughout this entire pandemic, even throughout the Omicron surge. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case for other communities. So Mike, I think the key thing is to keep that conversation going with the leadership and the elders in the community providing all the supports that we can, whether it's health promotional material, dispelling all the myths that we can, making sure that the vaccines are available and um, you know, just trying to get that message out there in the community, having that conversation. That's what I have learned and I'll stop there and James will provide the perfect answer now. Go ahead, James. Thank you, uh, Dr. Douglas. That, that was, uh, I think, you provided the, the right context for this. And, and uh, um, Mike asked a really great question because this is one of the things that I've been trying to understand. And, and Lloyd, we'd had an email exchange earlier today in terms of I'm very interested and my colleagues are very interested in, in trying to find out 
what it is that uh, is, are the reasons for some people not wanting to get back vaccinated. And, and who are those people? Are they the young people or are they middle-aged people or are they uh, older people like uh, Lloyd? And so, so the, the, and we, we don't know the questions and, and I think it's the answer to these questions and I think it's wrong to assume. So um, this is something that we, um, I certainly would like to find out more information. I'm sure that uh, Lloyd would as well, trying to understand that. And then to be able to address specifically what the, um, what the issues are, because Lloyd and I can stand here, sit here and, and say, this is, you should get vaccinated. And here's, here, here's the New England Journal article that says why you should get vaccinated, but it's just not hitting where we need to um, hit. And you're seeing the, the consequences and, and Mike and, and understanding what this means. So I'll say two things about that, that um, immunity, with vaccines, with COVID-19, while we initially thought was um, what we call sterilizing type immunity, that is people would not get infected. Again, we've, uh, um, the, the cruel teacher of COVID has told us that the, with Omicron, even though you're vaccinated, that you can still get infected. Not always, but like it's, it, it, you have high degree of protection, maybe 70% protection, um, soon after you've um, had your uh, third or fourth dose, but that does decrease over time. But I think one of the things that um, it's, the, the, the probability of people becoming sick, the chances that you're becoming very sick, what is clear is associated with age. So we all have responsibilities to protect those who are older and most vulnerable to bad outcomes with COVID-19. So we can focus in and ensure that they get vaccinated with as many doses that they need to be up to date, and it would be four doses. Then after that, with people in the community are vaccinated, that even though everybody may not be vaccinated, and even though there may be breakthrough infection, infections, I think one of the ideas here is that instead of having a peak where there's a lot of infections occurring all at the same time, what we're trying to do is push down that peak, recognize that COVID will come through, but the, the number of people infected at any one time will be less. And so the more people are vaccinated, and it doesn't have to be 100% for, for this to happen, you can still affect the how quickly the virus goes through a community by having people who are uh, vaccinated, because they'll act as fire breaks in, in the transmission. The last thing that I'll say is, while vaccination is the most important thing and, and uh, in terms of protecting communities against COVID-19 and allowing life to sort of come back to some normality, there, there are other things that you can do and that can be encouraged in a community. So there are things like masking, right? These are the other public health measures. So masking and the highest protection that you can uh, achieve is with a, a well-fitting mask that filters well. And so those are typically find in, found in N95, KN94 type masks or a medical mask, you know, or even a cloth mask. But the second two are, don't offer as much protection. So, um, uh, you know, I would certainly endorse among those who are, uh, have any uh, serious illness that uh, they wear the highest degree of protection that's accessible. The, the next thing is that, uh, you know, avoiding large, gatherings indoors when there are uh, large numbers of people who are unvaccinated. And that will slow down the transmission as well because there'll be fewer people become infected. The other thing is, that was we're learning more about uh, and, the, and the being humbled by transmission of COVID is ventilation. And that's really important as well. So it goes by your risk of contracting COVID if you're outdoors and you're uh, 10 meters from somebody or, or zero. Um, but as soon as you start to move closer, and then as soon as you move within that two meter zone, um, especially indoors, then the chances uh, increase. Outdoor, where there's lots of ventilation, you're going to lower the, the chances of transmission in, under any circumstances, but, um, and, and your risk will only increase if you're very close to the, uh, the other person with like a, a realistic chance of infection. So, but indoors, opening the windows, obviously uh, um, Lloyd, and Nick have uh, told me that there's snow 
in your community. So you might want to not do that yet, but uh, I'm told that uh, spring and summer will come. But uh, um, any um, uh, any time that uh, you can uh, uh, um, suggest or for any community buildings where the ventilation can be improved, those are important steps to take. So, so vaccine is one of the planks that we use to uh, help prevent uh, transmission of COVID. But there are very there are important other public health measures that um, you can also implement that are still very effective. And I told you about the most effective um, methods, but even if those aren't uh, accessible to you, the one, the other things that I did describe to you still are um, offer protection. So I'll, I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brooks. All right, next question. Can you explain community immunity? I like how that kind of rhymes and rings. I think we usually say herd immunity, but I like, I think I prefer community immunity. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so thanks for that uh, question, Lloyd. So I, I touched on that and maybe that's why you brought it up as, as the nice um, connection. So we, models of how we think about uh, um, vaccination and um, uh, uh, community immunity come from other infectious diseases. And one of the most uh, famous vaccines that we've had, and it's one of, I think the only disease that's been eliminated on the planet from human infections is smallpox. And, 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 and you can think of uh, uh, other diseases such as um, probably uh, uh, another one would be uh, uh, say a hepatitis B immunization. So if you're immunized against hepatitis B or smallpox, you will not get infected with the virus. And if you're not, if you don't get infected, then you can't transmit it to anybody else. And so over time, as the number of people become, um, uh, in the, the amount of the percentage of people who become vaccinated, then the disease will no longer transmit among those people. And you can reach a threshold. It's usually very high, 90%, 95%, that the amount of uh, the possibility that the virus can transmit in a population is so low that even people who have not been vaccinated will be protected against infection. And they may not be vaccinated because they have reasons why they can't take the vaccine. So that is when you have what the term is sterilizing immunity, that is the, 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 um, the virus is killed by the vaccine in a person so you never get infected, then you can achieve what is called um, community immunity. And uh, the, another term that you may see, hear about is, is herd immunity. So the, the, the problem, and I, I discussed it a little bit before, is that we can't achieve, at least with the current vaccines, sterilizing immunity. So that there will be people who are fully vaccinated or up to date with the vaccination who will get the virus. And then we will then transmit the virus to somebody else. However, an important uh, um, concept here, an important thing that we need to understand is, is what I was describing to Mike, that with a sufficient number of people in a population who um, are um, vaccinated and then also recently vaccinated, that's another wrinkle in here because with COVID-19, you have really good immunity for three or four months, and then it will start to go down, at least with the, the Omicron. So you need to have people in a, in, a, in a community who are regularly keeping their um, high levels of immunity and or other people who have been infected. Because as I said before, if you've had COVID-19, you have good protection for, again, a short period of time. And if you have in the community high levels of vaccination, some people who have been infected with COVID-19, it's the shape of the uh, wave of COVID that goes through that community will be different. So in terms of community immunity, it's not the typical way that I described to you before, but I think we should think about it differently. And we should think about instead of having an overwhelming crush of infections in a community, when you have lots of people who are vaccinated and other people who have been previously infected, it will be slower, more gradual, 
more manageable. You'll still have, you'll not have all of the, you know, your nurses who are off sick with COVID. You'll not have all of the people who are running the water plant or picking up garbage or in the band office off sick because the rate of infection in that community will be less. And so there will be fewer people sick all at the same time. So I think thinking about COVID-19, that's the kind of community immunity that we will be achieving. Thank you, James. I see that Nick is back. So Nick, you have another question for us from our friends online. Yes. Um, so our next question is coming uh, in from our Facebook feed. And uh, the question is, I am triple vaccinated, but have COVID-19 right now. Can I get infected again? Ah, that's a great question. Let me give you, let me give James some time to think. <laughs> um, so I recently read, um, yes, that individuals who are triple vaxxed um, still got infected, um, a breakthrough infection. And some individuals even reinfected with this new subvariant, uh, this BA2 that is very tricky, it can evade the protection even that's on board, it seems, could be weighing in, James, um, from either prior vaccinations or prior infections. Um, but the good thing is that it's not, that's not the majority in terms of the situation, but excellent question. And again, I'll just flip it over to James. So, uh, you know, I, I said before we learned from history, six months after, uh, okay, I'll ask, first of all, uh, uh, Lloyd, I'll ask Lloyd the question. What do you think your protection is against Omicron after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, roughly? Percent, percent protection. Percent protection, like after two weeks? After, after two weeks, dose? yeah. yeah after uh, your second dose against Omicron. Okay, you know what? I don't recall at this time. You were the, so let's say, the <laughs> six, 60, let's say 65%. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now here's here's now I've got now I've got you running here. So what's yeah. what's your protection after six months? It drops. Very low. It drops That's right. in the boots. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you're absolutely right, Lloyd. And it's down like in the one study that I well, it's actually a couple of studies, but the one number that I remember is eight percent. Yeah. That's and nothing. And and so um it's uh, and and for the uh, uh, the listener, the viewer, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, it's really, you know, what, what can I say? You did everything right. You did everything that you should, without going to details of knowing how soon after you received your third dose um, that you uh, uh, contracted COVID. But that's yeah, it's, it's it's unfortunate. But the other question I I would ask is that. Uh, without getting into the details, but I would say that it was probably unlikely that you ended up having to go to hospital, and 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 that and that you ended up on a on a breathing machine. So, taken into context, it wasn't for for naught that that you still derived benefit from it. And again, I don't know the the details here, but you might have had a much milder infection than you would have had otherwise. So, and, and the, if we go back to the, um, uh, and, 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 and I also just want to say that um, not for, and while I've got a chance here, while it's in my mind, not to forget that uh, we are in a unique time. It's an amazing time in science that never has a vaccine been developed so quickly against uh, a, a new infection. And never have we developed what we call therapeutics or drugs to treat COVID-19. So, if you do get COVID, remember Paxlovid is available. Lloyd has stocks of it in his basement, and it's 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 a safe and effective treatment to prevent um, um, bad outcomes from uh, um, from COVID nineteen. And and so I just want to say that now. But as we go back to uh, the viewer's question, which was, you know, can I get COVID nineteen again? And um, and I can't say with certainty that uh, with this variant uh, that uh, you won't get infected again. I can, what I can say is that uh, I think in the short term, 
you would have a high degree of protection. But uh, three months from now, four months from now, I can't say that that will be true. And the other thing that I will, and so that's why it'd be important for you to get your fourth dose. And the other thing that I would say is that, again, as we Lloyd and I have both agreed here, is the, um, that we're, we're humbled here because there may be a new variant that comes along that is even trickier for the immune system to, to prevent. So, so while that may seem a bit pessimistic, I gave you, I probably should have reversed things and gave you the more positive news first, which is that uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're, you're well. And, and I'm saying that I, um, that is one of the things that is durable with these vaccines. It's keeping people from having serious outcomes, ending up in hospital or with a breathing tube or, or worse. And I'll stop there. And thank you for the question. I think I think that's the same message I'd like to repeat and echo that um, you know being up to date with your vaccinations, even if you get infected, uh, you know your chances of being hospitalized or ending up in the ICU or dying is significantly reduced. And um, a part of kind of like the way forward, especially with that question from Mike, you know, having living with the unvaccinated around us is that we may get infected, but what we'd want for individuals is probably to have mild infections if they do get infected and that we can manage, that we can deal with. Uh, some key messages that I'm kind of working on, James, is um, one of the first ones is like, if you get COVID, don't give it to others. <laughs> so if I have COVID-19 symptoms, I should self-isolate, go get a COVID test if I can, that sort of a thing. That's a key message. The other thing too, is to realize that vaccines, we have lots of evidence and it's National Immunization Awareness Week that the COVID vaccine is safe and it's effective. And um, that's a clear message now also, and it's effective, not just for adults, but for our children as well. And we should go and get the vaccine. The other key message I would say is kind of, let's keep on doing the basics, right? James spoke about the basics you know, wearing that mask, um, avoided uh, crowded public indoor spaces, uh, continuing to wash your hands, that sort of a thing. Those are like the basics that we're going to hold on to those basics for a long time. And it does help those basics. It did help with influenza and probably other other viruses. Um, you know, so those are kind of like good things to hold on to, um, you know, moving forward. And uh, the other two, and James just mentioned them, is that Thank goodness we have these oral treatments. My basement is not full of Paxlovid. It's probably it's at the nursing station. Um, but we do have them in the region. Um, so we have those treatments. And what we need to do is we need to identify those individuals who are uh, eligible for the treatment as quickly as we can when they get COVID and offer them that treatment, like, like low threshold, no barriers, easy and quick access to, or, to Paxlovid, key. Then the last thing that we need to do is to identify the most vulnerable individuals and protect them. How do we protect them? Ensuring that they're up to date with their vaccines. Um, if we are sick, if I have COVID, I don't go and visit James. He said that I was old, but everybody knows. Just look at the picture. He's older. So I'll make sure I don't visit James while I have my COVID. I just kind of keep my COVID to myself. Those are things that we have to do um, you know, as we move forward. So again, uh, happy to know that you have your three doses on board and we, we, we pray that you recover quickly and uh, wish, you, wish you all the best. All right, let's go on to the uh, 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 kind of next question. Um, let me go because it's National Immunization Awareness Week. You want me to switch things up a little bit? All sure. right. What kinds of diseases do childhood vaccines protect from? So we're moving a little bit away from just COVID vaccines. I think we have hammered that message, get your COVID vaccines, but it's National Immunization Awareness Week. What kinds of diseases do childhood vaccines protect from? Okay, Lloyd. Yeah. I have the list here. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's do a game let's here, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, name me three diseases that uh, childhood vaccinations protect you against, and then I'll name three. And then we'll All go right. until we run out of gas. All right, all right, all right, all right. You know what? The the easy one. Um, I'm just gonna say MMR. Um, because it's like measles, mom's rubella. Easy. There you go. 
<laughs> so so that's so those those are uh, very important to see. And and that's a measles is another good example where we got where there's good community immunity with that. That we very rarely see measles outbreaks, and that's because sometimes vaccines don't work. And so there's measles, German measles, and and mumps, and 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 the mumps. I always remember the picture of Sidney Crosby. We had big swollen. Uh, lymph nodes in his neck. Okay, so that's excellent. Excellent, Lloyd. Okay, so I'm going to, so then the, uh, okay, PPT. So yeah. those, those things, so diphtheria used yeah. to be, um, it's, a, it's an infection that you end up with in your mouth and it causes a membrane to go over your, the back of your throat and it makes these terrible toxins. And it used to be probably the number three killer of children in the world and now, Nobody sees diphtheria at all. So that's one. Um, <clears throat> uh, what's other dip? P, pertussis. Mm -hmm. So pertussis, whooping cough, the 100 day cough. And that's, um, that again is, uh, in the absence of that, it's again, used to be one of the high on the list killers of children, especially uh, um, very, very uh, um, small children, babies, I guess we call them, but babies. And because it's, um, uh, it's such a, a terrible infection for babies to have, now we've come around and we give mums a booster when they're pregnant. So it's very important for, I'll take a, a chance to plug this. When you're pregnant is get boosted with pertussis vaccine so that you pass those antibodies onto your child when the, and when the child is uh, in the womb. And that will protect the child and stop them getting sick from pertussis until they're old enough to receive their own vaccine. The other thing that'll, um, another in my three uh, letters is tetanus. And tetanus is a terrible disease. It's the other word, the other title for it is a uh, lockjaw. And that's because your muscles just go into tetany. And it can be so bad that you can, your muscles will squeeze by themselves that'll actually break your bones. And this used to be a terrible, infection and uh, uh, occurs very rarely now, but again, I'll take the opportunity to say that you need to get boosted uh, for this infection throughout your life every, every 10 years. So, so those, are, those are my three. Okay, back to you. I'll just get, give me another one, Lloyd. All right, uh, the, you know, um, we have polio, we have Haemophilus influenzae, um, we have varicella for chicken pox and a little bit older, hepatitis B, we have HPV, we have the meningococcal vaccine. So yeah, um, I think I, I think I've exhausted the list a little bit, a little bit. There's more, uh, you know. Okay, so let me so let me say so, so you're, you're you're showing off Lloyd. And so I am, I I am. If I could, so again a couple of things that I just like to um, point like polio again used to be a, a, a terrible disease where people would become paralyzed and um, we still see some people that have post polio syndrome, um, but now it just, it never happens. And, and I think there's a, a, a good plug here for, again, a very, um, very important vaccine, both for, for men and women now, and that's the HPV vaccine. So that's, I'm going to say it's, it's, it's um, the virus that causes this, what we see typically would be in the medicine business would be genital warts. Okay. But, the most important thing about this vaccine, it prevents cancer. That is the thing that's the most amazing about it. So here you have a vaccine that stops women getting uh, uh, cervical cancer uh, or anal cancer and stops men getting anal cancer. And it may offer benefit for some of the uh, uh, throat cancers as well. Anyway, it's very important uh, uh, vaccine. And, and uh, the meningitis vaccines that Lloyd uh, mentioned can be a devastating infection because it's an infection of the brain. And so it's uh, in terms of things that I, that I worry about, things that I've seen and treated, meningitis is one of the things that I'm, I'm very frightened of. And so it just makes, I mean, it's just so clear to me that the, the power of vaccines in terms of preventing these terrible infections and also preventing things such as cancer and and uh, Slifner, you're lucky because Dr. Douglas knows all of these. He's able to just riff them off. So uh, 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 you, I know that you're, uh, you'll, he'll ensure that these uh, uh, vaccines will be given to all of the people um, that are eligible for them. So, 
So thanks, Lloyd. You know, thank you, James. And as we talk about kind of vaccines and childhood vaccinations, uh, it's very important that your organization and our organization work together to get the vaccine coverage rates in our communities up. For example, I'm, I'm going to cheat here now looking at some data from uh, this would be from the government of Canada. They're, you know, they have an infographic that's um, named vaccines work. You have seen this one, um, James. So for whooping cough, they're saying that, you know, um, since we're using this vaccine, we've seen an 87% decrease in, in kind of the rates for whooping cough, 99% decrease in rates for measles, 99% decrease in rates of, uh, for mums, and same 99% for rubella, same 99% for diphtheria, as you've mentioned. We don't really see that. And for polio, guess what? 100%. 100%. Can you imagine that? 100%. And, you know, where I grew up in the islands, right? I grew up in Jamaica. And right beside um, the University Hospital for West Indies is what we call the Mona Rehab. So it's like a rehabilitation kind of institution. And primarily that's where you'd see a lot of individuals, um, you know, uh, essentially, you know, after that illness, you know, they have so many um, disabilities, you know, um, you know, and it's just tragic. But think of a vaccine kind of preventing all of that tragedy uh, in families, you know, um, so just want to say, we just want to hear to promote uh, childhood vaccinations do prevent very, very serious disease. And as Dr. Brooks have mentioned, and I like the fact that he's like, he could tell us stories, you know, and, and so forth and so on. That's great. That tells you that he has been around for a long time. And he's also experienced, he said that he has treated meningitis. I remember that in my pediatric rotation, um, is that that's just a horrible kind of a situation when you see a child with meningitis and that could have been prevented with a vaccine. Um, you know, and it's, it's just horrific what these, uh, you know, children have to go through. Um, and, and, you know, thankfully with treatment, you know, many will probably make it, but sometimes there are deficits, you know, um, after that. And that's just sad. So I'm all for childhood immunizations. And, and Lloyd, if I can just add, there was a, a, a case of a child that I saw um, when I was doing a pediatric ID who came in with epiglottitis. So mm -hmm. the little thing in the back of your throat that shuts off when you swallow and it stops the, the food or the water going down into your breathing tube can become so inflamed or so uh, uh, um, irritated that it actually blocks off the breathing. And the, the, the bacteria, that normally causes that or typically causes that is Haemophilus influenza B. That's, and that's what Lloyd described as one of the childhood um, uh, uh, vaccine preventable diseases. So you take the vaccine and you don't get that infection. The mom came and said that she was anti-vaccine and she had not given the child that vaccine. And she said after her child came who nearly died, but we were able to, uh, to treat the child and recover it, that she um, was going to become very uh, staunchly uh, promoting vaccines and saying how important they are. And so my, my takeaway from that is, sure, you may be lucky and, and never uh, get that type of infection, but, but why would you even want to play that game when the vaccines are safe and then you can be assured nothing is 100% in life, but within the bounds of what is a reasonable expectation, ensure that your child can have a safe and, uh, and, and have the best chance to, um, for a, a healthy childhood um, by, by doing something so simple and uh, so safe as taking a vaccine. So, and I'll hand it back to you, Lloyd. Thank you. I'm just looking at the time and, uh, you know, time flies when we're having fun. But this is a very important question. It's a simple question, um, James, but I think it's a question for viewers, for parents, for guardians, for aunties and uncles and cookums and, you know, leadership. What should I do if my child has missed a vaccine or is behind? Can my child catch up? And I know that with, the, you know, COVID has really turned the world upside down and Many of our kids, my kids, you know, the, the health unit was just kind of just fo so focused on COVID. We need to get a couple doses in now. Um, um, you know, 
what can I do? Because we really need our children to be up to date with their childhood immunizations. Talk to me, James, what can I do? So there is the, 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 short, the short answer, and I know I should have spent more time on short answers, is uh, that you just pick up where you left off. So it's very, there is, it's really well described. The um, Ontario has a guide for exactly what to do if you've missed a vaccine. But the short part, the short story on that is you just pick up where you left off. So you take your child to where you uh, would have, um, where you normally get your vaccines, whether it's at the uh, nursing station, whether it's at the local public health unit, whether it's at your family physician or at the nurse practitioner that you see, and you just go and go, listen, you know, I was supposed to, my child was supposed to get the uh, Pentavax vaccine at this time or the pneumonia vaccine, the meningitis vaccine. We missed it because of COVID. No problem. They just look up on the list and go, okay, here you go. And this is when you do on the next dose. So it's no reason to be uh, ashamed. It's no reason to not take your child for that vaccine, but the, uh, and you would, and the expectation is that uh, the vaccine should be just as effective as if you'd been right on schedule. So take your, if you missed a dose, take your child for the dose. Okay. And, and I have to slip this one in. There's another important one. Um, you know, so I, I missed a couple of doses and, but, but I got the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you know, how do I kind of like get back to the routine immunizations, you know, like COVID vaccine is so new can I get the COVID vaccine if I just got, you know, another routine immunization or vice versa? Can you help me with that? Sure. So um, this is this is I, I think about this a lot in, in a different context. That uh, let me, let me tell you something, uh, Lloyd. That the, the the greatest thing about uh, about us as as humans is we have an immune system. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's uh, an example of why it's important. You have more germs that live on you and live in you than you actually have human cells, okay? You know, if you were to count the number of bacteria in your poo when you went, go for, went to go for a poo, if you were to count those bacteria, there are more bacteria in there than there are humans that have ever lived on the planet. Okay, so we're always we're always fighting against. And for every time you brush your teeth, you put bacteria into your blood, and uh, you have an immune system that just deals with it. You never know that you're covered with all of these bacteria inside, outside, and they keep going to your system. So, with this amazing immune system, there's nothing to worry about if you need to sort of go and get one vaccine and get two vaccines or three vaccines whatever you need to do in order to catch up, it's, it's perfectly safe. It's been not only from what I've told you from a theoretical perspective, because your immune system deals with all kinds of new infections every single day, dealing with three vaccines at one time, nothing. So you can, you can catch up, you can sort of say, okay, I'm giving the COVID-19 vaccine, this vaccine, and this vaccine, and you can take it at the same time. And that way you're not increasing the chances that you're going to miss out and fall behind once again. So I, hopefully that answered the question that, uh, that you were posing. Definitely. So uh, I have to slip this one in. I think we're close to the time now. And um, this is probably going to be my final question, Nick. Um, so oftentimes when we talk about immunizations or, or, or vaccines, you know, we think kids. But what about adults? Do adults get vaccinations? Um, you know, and could you talk about adult vaccination and the importance of adult vaccination? Oh, for sure. There is no, nobody, um, everybody benefits from vaccination. And we think about vaccination in terms of blocks. So we think about uh, childhood vaccinations, which we, we talked about and, and you demonstrated your encyclopedic knowledge of vaccine preventable diseases in children. And then we, we talk about school age vaccines and then we talk about adult vaccines. And so you get most of your vaccines when you're little and you get uh, other vaccines as you get older. And as an adult, 
you still need vaccines. And so I talked about one of them and I talked about getting the, uh, I think it's the TB. So you need tetanus boosting every 10 years so you don't end up with uh, the lockjaw, the tetanus thing that I described. The other thing is that as you get older, you also are at risk of developing pneumonia or blood infections that are uh, caused by the same germ or even meningitis. And so we recommend that people get pneumonia vaccines. And another thing, as, as Lloyd has pointed out, as you get older, you're also at, at risk, especially for people who had chicken pox, people being vaccinated against it uh, uh, as like the, the kids, but for older people like myself who had chicken pox when I was 21 in medical school, it was terrible. I'm at risk for developing shingles, which is uh, uh, an eruption of uh, chicken pox, which is dormant, lying dormant in your body. And it's terribly painful. And even after the rash disappears, you can be left with uh, um, ongoing pain. So, so there's another vaccine that you need. And uh, on top of that are the other two things that are really important is getting your influenza vaccine every year, and then also the COVID-19 vaccine. And I'll throw in a um, couple of other things in there. There's maybe uh, some women who are eligible for the HPV vaccine as adults who haven't received it before. And that's that one that prevents cervical cancer. It's an amazing vaccine. Um, and, uh, and also there's some people who might need to catch up for hepatitis vaccines, hepatitis B, which is one of the ones that's funded by the province. But also if you're traveling, I would highly recommend a hepatitis A vaccine, and uh, um, um, which again, very safe and uh, very effective. And I think I have to look at my list here, Lloyd, I have to, because my knowledge is not as encyclopedic as yours. And, and I, think, I think that's it. There, there, may, there, there may be other ones. There, there's other ones if you travel and different things. But those are the uh, those are the key ones. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, so much fun, and I'm hoping that the viewers really uh, enjoyed um, listening, tuning in, and learning. Um, you know, I learned a, a few things uh, this evening. Thank you, Doctor uh, James Brooks, for kind of stopping by our Facebook Live, uh, talking with our communities. Uh, this week is National Immunization Awareness Week, and it is very important for all of us, I did say us, including me, to be up to date with our vaccines, whatever they are, we just need to be up to date. And um, again, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. It's what, again, Nick, acwinfo at slifna.com. Am I right? If you have any questions with regards to this National Immunization Awareness Week, I think we sent some stuff out in terms of health promotional material on social media. Um, if you if you want to get a hold of James and and, and talk to him some more, um, yeah, you know, I'll pass some of the questions over to James any day, every day. Um, would be more than happy to do all of that. So, uh, Nick, I'm kind of saying just really a, a fun time this evening and um, go get your COVID vaccine. Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to help uh, um, however I can. You know, I'm, I'm uh, in indigenous services, so I'm here to serve the community. So however I can help, please let me know. And, uh, and the, the last thing I'll say is that uh, 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 Lloyd and I walk the talk for every vaccine that uh, we can get, we get. I, I tell you just quickly, I went to West Africa to help out with Ebola a couple of times. And uh, the nurse said to me, these are all vaccines that you need to get. And uh, I said, okay, give them to me. She said, but I'd scheduled an hour for counseling. I said, you know what? These are all going to protect me against uh, you know, terrible infections like rabies, please just give them to me. And, uh, and so I got all the vaccines and, uh, and then I felt uh, protected. You know, and this important part about this is when I went, I, I knew I was protected so I can come back to my family. And that's, it's more than, just, more than just me that I'm protecting when I get vaccinated. So and I'll stop there.
But thank you for the chance to speak to uh, speak to everyone. Thank you.